Tracy's gone mute. Right, welcome everybody um, to the meeting of the East Riding of Yorkshire and Kingston upon Hull Joint Local Access Forum. Um, we are now streaming live on YouTube, so I would ask you to uh, consider your replies so we don't get anything untoward. Um, we have apologies from absence from Ruth Marsden, Councillor Nicola of Hull City Council, Councillor Bayram of East Riding, um, Peter Kite and John Nicholson. Andrew Herson may arrive late due to another appointment, so he'll just pop up when he pops up. Do we have any declarations of interest relating to items on the agenda from any members or we don't appear to have any members of the public? I'm not sure if I should do. Um, there's the Jocks Lodge thing about the crossing, but it's nowhere near my land, so I don't think I should declare an interest. Is that I, think, I think you're all right. I think you're all right on that, Linda. It's, it's far enough away. Thank you. And welcome to Andy McIntosh. He's just Hello. popped up, our speaker. Yep. <laughs> right, we've, we've <laughs> just again. got started, Andy, so we're just doing declarations of interest and we haven't got any. Um, we have the next item on the agenda is questions from ob observers. Um, one question has appeared in writing relating to an unrecorded cul-de-sac footpath in Kirkella. This was received from a local resident. The footpath is close to the recent flood alleviation scheme and the path is currently blocked by a gate and further information has been sought from officers in the council's legal department flood management team um, so we can inform a response from the lap to the gentleman in question. It's not a strategic matter, but he has written to us. So I do feel that we should put together an answer um, probably pointing me in the direction of the correct departments, but we'll see what we can do for him. They have very few rights of way in Kerkella. Uh, have we any more questions have come in, Steve? Uh, no, that's 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 the only one, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, item four, minutes. Hello. 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 I, try, I tried to just raise my hand there, yeah? Oh, Hello. Right, Brian. You're not on sorry, camera, Brian. Uh, Oh, sorry. I, well, I, I'm, I'm a bit difficulty with the screen. I can't find things on the screen. <laughs> anyway, I, I, just in relation to that uh, yeah, that definitely. matter you, you've just raised, um, a colleague of mine had spoken to um, an ex-member of this committee about what he should do, and I, and the person that you that's com, that's written in the representations is that is the is the person I'm referring to, and he he'd spoken to me about this item or that was coming up on the agenda and it does say somewhere somewhere in the in the in the actual paper about you were the council was anticipating a section 14 uh, notice in relation to this and um, presumably from him but he did say to me he's had a look at it and he thinks it's going to be rather a lot of involved work that he doesn't feel that he could do um he said that his neighbour opposite um, has got some um, photographic and video evidence in it. But again, he's in his 80s and doesn't think he'd be able to to do anything. So um, if if that's where if that's where you were anticipating the section 14 coming from, I, I don't think it, it's going to happen. Well, if they want to put in a schedule 14 application, um, if it goes in now, I mean, I have to say, it could be sometime within the next 20 years before it gets dealt with. Yes, of course, because yeah. there are hundreds of them out there. Um, <laughs> if he feels he wants to put one in, though, I don't think he'll be, if he's that, that old, he probably won't be around in 20 years' time. <laughs> if he wants to put one in, I mean, I'm not being funny about that, but it's a fact, isn't it? Um, oh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope, I hope it will. To, I if hope his will be, wants to put 30. in a schedule 14, then... Yeah that direct but you know we're looking at what we've been asked to look yes, at yeah um which is a parochial rather than a strategic matter but you know yes, we do yeah, with those yeah. as well so we'll see what we can do for him does that answer your question? Say, I, what i'm just what i was saying was that he he feels that the process for him is rather involved and he doesn't think he has the has the time to do it. he's got a young child but his, his neighbor has actually got some photographic and video evidence but but he he said to me that he didn't he didn't think He'd be able to have the time to do it. So I just wanted to 
Well, you. well, as well, an well. as an access forum, it's not something that we would be doing. Yes, of course, of course. It yeah, has to yeah. come from a member of the public. So, yeah, if you'd yeah, like yeah. to ask him if he has any other um, willing. Yeah. Name. Yeah, yeah, he said they're they're all quite elderly where he lives, uh, other other than him. <laughs> so okay, then. Anyway. right, okay. Thanks. So we move on to item four, which is the minutes of the previous meeting on the fifteenth of September. Um, you've all got the minutes in front of you. So have we any um anything on there that is technically incorrect before we go to matters arising? I've not found anything. So yeah. everybody happy? Hands up if you're happy. Okay. So we move on to matters arising. Um, uh, sorry, Hazel. Can you hear me? It's Terry. Yes, Terry, yes, carry on. They got me. Uh, just one issue with um, <clears throat> uh, 24 stroke 21, item B about Ad Green Lanes to Walk in Riding website. Yes. I know that's what we said, probably. I wondered if it would be more specific and could say. Uh, unmetal highways or unmetal roads, so it links it with the the wording of the East Riding uh, policy. In other words, that's the term that the East Riding Council used for um, green lanes. Is I it think, necessary? I think we can probably use both statements because um, some of the green lanes are, are, are already on the list of streets as unmetal unclassified county oh, yeah. roads um yeah. but some of them of course are on the old stick map which are currently nowhere to be seen anywhere so yeah I think so, we, need to, so we need to use both and and quote the stick yeah. map as well does that mean yes. your approval debbie yeah i think that's a good idea because it, it you know it, it tells you where the information is isn't it i suppose yeah that's yes. fine okay so you've got that steve um, so uh, there's nothing else in matters arising. Nothing on page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. Page six. That's a lot. So nothing, right? We've got nothing in matters arising. So um, we're supposed to... Sorry, Chair. Ian, is your hand up? Sorry uh, to, to put in, Chair. Yes, it was it was up for matters arising. I don't know where Hazel is at the moment. Sorry, I didn't get that, Ian. Yeah, go on. Um, just want to ask about 2321A, and that's the Booth Ferry Bridge. Do we have any information on this one? Yes, well, we had uh, over the page... Um, Steve gave a further update, and the bridge will remain open to the public during the works, but one footway at a time. So yes, they will I'm, have to cross the road, but... If right, gonna but have I'm, to... I'm wondering whether, in fact, we've moved on from the report or not. Have we had anything else, Steve, on Booth Ferry Bridge? I haven't, I haven't had anything formal uh, on that, Chair, Ian. I, I believe the, the construction work has has started or is certainly due to start uh, although i must admit i've not actually been been that way myself so uh, as i understand it it, it 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 is progressing as planned but i don't have any further details it's mike, mike butler can you hear me yeah Hi, mike. Can you hear mike carry on yeah. uh, i mean i live quite close to both very bridge and there seems to be very little happening apart from traffic lights which most people seem to be ignoring <laughs> But, but, but they're probably there till after probably there till after Christmas in that case. Or at least, but very little activity. Right. Uh, Brian Savage has got his hand up. Did you want to ask something, Brian? Hello, Brian. Hello, hello that, sorry, that, that was from before. All right, <laughs> from okay. Between. Sorry, I don't I uh, I've having difficulty with it. uh Yep, I think that is it. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Right. So we'll move on to item six, our speaker, which is an update on access matters from Natural England. And we welcome uh, Andy McIntosh, who's a senior specialist in access and engagement for Natural England. And um, we're delighted to see you, uh, Andrew. And you. Um, please tell us uh, what the latest is. Uh, well, is, well, well, don't get too excited. Um, <laughs> what I can say, I mean, I, I, I'd like to, be, to um, 
tell you more about an, uh, the environmental land management scheme. But to, just to recap about it, it's the it's obviously the new agri environment scheme, and it's split broadly into into three sections: the sustainable farming initiative, which is sort of um, basically it's, uh, revolves around standards, sort of uh, standards for sort of uh, um, farming in an environmentally sustainable manner. Um, there's local nature recovery, which is more like the um, sort of stewardship schemes, uh, more recent stewardship schemes, where that's one or, or a few farms with their own environment, set of environmental objectives and options, um, entering into uh, um, agreements to manage those uh, agreed sort of options. Uh, and there's also um, a wider sort of landscape scale called uh, landscape recovery, which is looking at sort of wider habitat recovery um, on sort of, sort of really large scale, uh, which will, will imply a large degree of cooperation. Um, for the past two years, we've been, uh, certainly sort of, uh, myself and a colleague, Pippa Langford, have been working on supplying evidence and potential um, public access measures, uh, suggestions and options um, for the scheme. Mainly the, the place where we would expect them to be is, is uh, local nature recovery. Um, so a, a lot of work's been done, lots of costings, lots of evidence uh, support. Um, what we're waiting for at the moment is an announcement from DEFRA. Um, it was gonna be in November, but it's been pushed back to winter. So it's probably gonna be sometime early next year um, about sort of final decisions on what and what won't be in local nature recovery. Um, I'm not as optimistic as I was, I think is, is all I can say really, um, about how much public access will, will be in it. Um, if it was all the things we suggested, it'd be much, much more than any previous agri-environment scheme. Um, but it depends on, it, it was always going to depend on the amount of money available and what the um, uh, department's uh, main objectives were. But uh, as I say, we are waiting for statement from DEFRA about what are the priorities for the scheme. Um, that being said, there's quite quite a lot of, more than any, any time I can remember in the past sort of 10 years, there's a, a sort of renewed interest in public access, perhaps born out of the past sort of two years uh, um, experience of lockdowns. Um, certainly sort of there's more interest in government about public access, funding it, looking for ways to improve it. Um, particularly some interest from the Treasury, which is always good, I think. Um, so again, we've been asked to supply evidence and justifications for in various areas that, sorry, I can't share them with you at the moment, but um, uh, we are, whenever we get the opportunity, we sort of um, speak up for public access and, and advertise as much as possible wherever it needs to be in government. So fairly optimistic that there, there will be some, something concrete coming out of that at some point. Um, I can't say exactly when, but so I'm afraid at the moment it's sort of we're waiting for this and waiting for that. So uh, that really is the update on sort of um, policy and, um, and schemes, really. Um, so I'll just, just stop there if anybody's got any sort of specific question. Oh, one thing I, um, I didn't mention that the um, tests and trials... Uh, which are linked to the environmental land management scheme it has been what a successful trial in the mendip hills uh, aonb run by the trails trust uh, which indicated that which looked at um, improving existing access and, and also creating new access and what the uh, reaction would be amongst uh, local land managers and by and large the reaction uh, according to the trails trust has been positive um, but obviously it has to be incentivized um, so, um, which is good because it, it adds more to the evidence that for, for supporting sort of the inclusion of public access um, in obviously in agri-environment schemes. But so that, that's where we are with it at the moment. I don't know if I've got any questions for Andy yeah, on the yeah. ELM. John Gayton basically got his hand up. You're on mute, John. I do it all the time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy, for coming along. 
first of all, let me declare my true colours that I represent uh, landowners and managers mm -hmm. and uh, broken down by you, a lifetime in agriculture. We very much appreciated the early stewardship schemes where you had permissive access. Certainly local people in the villages appreciated that as well. And uh, we wish something like that could reappear. I've often asked through the forum if we could have permissive access, particularly in this part of the world, to non-accessible access land, because we've got a quite a lot of access land in the Croats without any designated access to it. And it struck, struck me that that would be a way of joining up the, the environmental benefits and the public benefits, which would enable us to enhance our PR image as a landowner. And finally, this morning, I had a group of 10 ramblers came through my farm along farm tracks with permission because they were going to go for a walk before they went to our local community pub to stoke up with hot coffee. And they thoroughly enjoyed walking somewhere where they hadn't been supposed to go before. So, yes, there is a big demand for enhanced access managed in a responsible manner. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we appreciate you, that. Right, Ian's got his hand up, Ian Reid. Yeah. Yes, I'd like to ask Andrew, um, if uh, uh, on farming today, the other day, Andrew, in fact, there was a report that very few farmers had, in fact, actually signed up to this thing. Indeed, the, the, the lady, the presenter, in fact, they suggested, in fact, it was as little as 25 percent. Um, now, I'm just wondering whether, in fact, there's any indication um, that this is really going to be a bit of a damp squib, in fact, countrywide. And that's the first question. But the, the, the second uh, supplementary is that, and I don't want John or Gordon to be upset here, but in fact, one gets the impression that this is going to be desperate in the wetter west for farmers than it is in the east. Um, and of course, in fact, we happen to be in the east. And therefore, in fact, one might possibly be speculating that the take up is going to be less in our neck of the woods than it might be, in fact, for example, in upland Wales, where, of course, in fact, the fraction of the income to farmers through what was, in fact, the, um, uh, the cap in fact, was much bigger than, in fact, actually uh, it is in the east. Um. Yeah, um, with regards to sort of take up, really, I mean, it, I say this, there's three different elements of the scheme. The um, <coughs> sustainable farming, the, uh, sustainable farming initiative is, is more like the entry level scheme, I suppose you could, you could compare it to. So that would, well, I think the terms is wide and shallow. Uh, um, it, it's not particularly as demanding as the upper tiers of the scheme, but it aims at having many more people in it. So I don't know what the figures are referring to, whether it's either that level or the, uh, the high, or interest in the high tiers, because obviously they're set to start, actually set to start in 2000, you know, um, um, that's why I sort of starting sort of 2021, 22, but the others are sort of, uh, are looking to start in 2024. So in some ways it's early days for the higher tier of the scheme yet. Um, particularly as there aren't <laughs> details of payments etc about um out yet for um certainly the local nature recovery and landscape recovery um so i don't know whether those figures were referring to the, the sustainable farming initiative um but uh yeah so i'm sorry but what, what was the first question again i think well, well, it, it really combined, if it, it was rather more, in fact, you know, what excitement is there among the farming community, in fact, that they might, in fact, actually engage in this yeah. thing. We get, we're getting a clear indication that it's not going to be a universal interest. Yeah, well, I mean, the stewardship, the old stewardship schemes combined with the entry level and higher level and countryside stewardship did actually cover a, a fairly high, high, high proportion of the country, mostly in entry level stewardship. As I say, the the um, the payment rates aren't out for the um, high levels of the scheme yet, so I think it is a bit early to say. Um, oh, there's a carrot there. Yeah, carrot <laughs> incentives. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very much. Anybody else with any more questions? If if I could just come in, Hazel. Um, 
we're somewhat in the dark as to where we are payment wise on the schemes, as you well alluded. Um, a lot of it is, was being promised as income foregone. And unfortunately, we're not sure under the new regime what income is going to be anyway. Uh, um, on, under, with a higher tier um, and, and stewardship, and there is at the moment a promise of rolling over for an, another year or two until we, show, until we know what's going on. And that way, at least, that enables Natural England to have some environmental work on the books. But uh, the, the scheme in general, and I was involved in one of the pilots of it, to the industry, it's a little bit like trying to pin fog to a wall. We're not sure where we're going or how we're going to get there. So I'm afraid uh, we need a little bit more views before we'll commit ourselves for a longer term. Thank you. Gordon's got his hand up. Gordon Horcroft, uh, you've got yes, your hand up. Um, yes, I have. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear can you. Can you hear me, Hazel? Yes, I can hear okay, you. Okay, right. Well, I'll give you a short answer to what will the take-up be. Well, if we what we what the offer was, perhaps there was a chance there would be a take-up. But at the moment, there is so bland and so uh, non-discreet that, that no farm with any sense at all will get involved in this. And this is widely accepted across the industry. There is great scepticism about what the intentions of the government are and how it's been presented. So we're not going to subscribe to it. Uh, myself, I've got a, uh, a, a, we've entered into the Elms thing uh, to see uh, roughly how it would apply to our own farm. Um, but it's still so, uh, there, there is no, no concrete thing. Why would I, how on earth could I accept a scheme that has no, no definition? There is no definition here. And I've been saying this for the last five years, that we are waiting for something to be said, some, some scheme that isn't, to, uh, that is clear and that we can go forward with. As John said, we've all, done our best to, to participate in countryside stewardship, and some of them have been very successful. Um, and they were quite clear-cut schemes. But this new scheme that uh, started off with Michael Gove announcing a green Brexit, they are infantile and childish, and I'm very sorry to have to say that. So it, there will be no take-up until something sharpens up. Okay. Good work, Gordon. Right, Steve, you've got your hand up. Yes, thanks, Chair. I wonder if I, if I can just make a point on behalf of Peter Kite, who sent his apologies today. But the ELMS was a, was a particular issue that that Peter had flagged up with me. Um, I'll just read out a, a part of his email, if, if I may. Um, Peter said, I would be pleased to hear from other members if they would support further proactive input before EL, ELMS is finalised on how the matter of access can be incorporated and what form this input should take. Now, I, I really just wanted to make that point on, 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 on P Peter's uh, behalf, but perhaps if, if, I, if I may sort of ask a quick question of Andy as well, but for, it doesn't sound as if there's gonna be, gonna, gonna be further um, stakeholder consultation on this, Andy, but I just wonder if, if you're perhaps able to, to advise. I think from the forum members' perspective, clearly waiting for the announcement from government and, and finding out what's in that sounds like the, the next step before determining what or whether the forum can do anything. Yeah, I mean, it, um, just to answer my part on that, it's, um, yeah, the sort of need of sort of local input in this because there's a whole series of tests, trials, and uh, um, envisaged for all, sort of, all levels of the uh, of Elms. Um, and we were told a few months ago that there isn't a specific one for public access yet, but there might hope to be within the next year or so, yeah. um, which obviously would uh, be sort of uh, rolled out in various areas. But I haven't heard anything more about that since, really. Um, and I say we do share your frustration about the um, seminate of information about the scheme, really, uh, because you, you'd appreciate that Natural England's actual role in in Elms is different to how it's been in previous stewardship schemes. Um, so, uh, we're obviously not as involved with the, with the current country stewardship as we used to be with previous environmental stewardship. 
and even that natural England's role in, in Elms is far from determined yet. We'll obviously have some advisory role, but we're not sure what yet. Hi, thank you very much yeah, for that. Thanks, Has anybody else got any more questions on ELMS or ELMS? Can I ask you one then? Um, some time ago, there was mention of a new link person at Natural England who would be the link between the LAFs, the regional LAFs, the individual LAFs and Natural England. Has anything come of that or is it likely to or has that one slipped off the edge of the table? No, not quite. I, I still see it, Hazel. <laughs> You're sick of seeing me. It's always me, isn't it? <laughs> but um, I've been assured that in the next financial year, i.e. starting in April, um, that there will be some provision for LAF support. Um, and I will keep reminding them all the way up to that date. And as soon as I have something concrete, I'll get back to you. Uh, but I have sent over... I provided all the details for um, what the, the old LAF coordinator's role that Rob Leak used to do um, and what that would look like in various, you know, if it wasn't, it was, it was half of that or three quarters of that. Um, so, but I've been assured by someone else that they are looking at providing some resource for it. So hopefully, um, there was more input from that from England. <laughs> um, on, a, on a slightly um, wider note, we are unusually for the first time in well, probably about sort of 10 years sort of taking on staff and we have actually increased the size of the of our access team. because It has just been me and Pippa Langford doing the bits that aren't coastal access or national trails, etc. Um, but we've got two new specialists, one for recreation and one for, for public engagement. And we've, we are mapping out how we want public access to look in natural England and DEFRA really. Um, at the moment, um, but as I said there is renewed interest in or, or support for, for public access in within governments and um, how this funding for sort of new posts is part of it. So hopefully um, there'll, be, there'll be sort of concrete things coming out of that, including some more support. Well, hopefully it'll involve joined up rights of way, missing links, access to um, open access land that we can't get to now. Um, and higher rights so that all non-motorised users can get out, out in the countryside. Um, I think that goes across the board. I think I think we can all agree with that one. Yes. Um, and the other thing was um, coastal access. Have we got any... Um, how are we doing on that? Um, mm, must admit, I, don't, I didn't check before I came on. I should have done, really. <laughs> um, I, I usually get an update I from... I was going to throw you a curve ball, Andy. <laughs> I, I can uh, I can send you a link to what what the latest uh, is afterwards if you would. Right. Okay. That's fine. Uh, anybody I can check that with our sort of coastal access team, which I'm. Anybody got any more questions for Andy? Yeah. Well, you're all very quiet today. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us, Andy, and giving us a bit of an right. update. And um, no doubt we'll have you back again at some stage if you wish to stay for the rest of the meeting. Feel free, but I'm sure you're, uh, you've got lots of pressing matters. That's all right. I'll stay. What's going on? Right, OK, then. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really interesting. Thank you, Andy. Um, so we move on to item seven, which is Hull City Council's update. Alan Davison, if you'd like to present your updated report. Everybody's got a um, copy of this. It's on pages seven and eight. You're not on camera, Alan. <laughs> Mm. What more? We can't hear you, Alan. You sound like you're in the swimming pool. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? I think it must be a high tone. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a frog in a pond. A seance. Sorry, I want to try it. Yeah, it sounds like a seance. We'll have to come back to you, Alan. Um, if you'd like to mute yourself while you sort yourself out, and we'll come back to you. Okay. okay.
Chair, Chair, can I can I just add? Alan did send me an email uh, this morning. He did mention as he was out and about, his his signal might not be great. So I can I can read uh, um, two or three specific points that Alan sent this morning. If that's of, of okay, of that's any, fine. Yeah, of, of any any benefit. Firstly, with regard to Hull Public Right of Way Number Twenty Two, Alan said that he is expecting uh, that. Uh, to add that ABP did not manage to carry out the planned works on the 2nd of December. However, they have stated that the King George Dock Lockgates walkway will be reinstated by the end of this week. So that sounds, that sounds positive. Alan also mentioned that public right of way number 11 is currently closed around the deep on safety grounds. This is due to a faulty window that needs to be replaced. The deep are still awaiting proposals from, from the relevant contract to replace the specialist blazing unit before the footpath can be, can be reopened. And the third point that Alan asked me to raise was the mode shift stars article that is referred to within the, the meeting papers. And Alan just asked, asked if we could uh, could sort of credit this to Oliver uh, Oliver uh, Rawlings of First Step Sport, um, as I think he provided the information to Alan. But they were the three items Alan asked me to uh, uh, to specifically mention. I thought I'd just cover those off if Alan isn't able to uh, to rejoin us later. I, I think um, thumbs up all those who are, um, want to support the Mode Shift Stars scheme. Anybody against it? Right, there you go. That's the answer on that one. Um, with regard to the deep, it's just one of those things. There are other ways around it. So I think we'll, we'll manage that one OK. Uh, public right away, number 22, King George Dock. I'm not holding my breath. It's gone on for years. So we'll see what happens at the end of the week. I might have a wander down and have a look. Might go down on Christmas Day, see what I've got to do. Right. Um, any more queries about Alan's report? We might get ah Alan Ribbon carry on. So it's just a couple, and I'm conscious Alan probably can't answer. But if he can hear, maybe he can he can drop a note later. So I notice in the report it says there's a revised planning application for the Castle Hill Holderness Dream uh, drain the flood scheme. I know there was some concerns about access, uh, particularly disability access, uh, because of the barriers that were proposed. Do, do we know if those barriers have been uh, have actually been removed? In the new plans, I think Steve Howdell, you you answered for us on this behalf, didn't you? The fact that they were putting in barriers that weren't big enough for getting trampers through, and the whole thing had like a barrier every ten yards. I, I can update Alan as best I can. C certainly, the the proposals that have gone forward to the two planning authorities included the K barriers. Uh, the original proposals uh, included A-frame barriers, uh, and the K barriers uh, are, are designed to, to be more flexible to, to allow uh, um, uh, additional users access through those barriers. But in terms of the response that collectively the, the, the LAF uh, submitted to the planning uh, authorities, uh, as a group, the forum has still raised concerns uh, with, with the proposals um, and for two reasons. The first one is the fact that, that the access control measures proposed are still seen as, as potential barriers to legitimate users rather than uh, being, being there to stop the, 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 the unlawful users and particularly the, the motorcyclists. And second concern that, that the forum raised was still on the basis that the, the proposed new routes uh, for the scheme, the new access routes, whilst being very welcome, the fact there are some new routes, they would still be on a purely permissive basis, so could be withdrawn at any stage. But as far as I understand, Alan, the proposals haven't yet been determined by, by the planning committee. So the, the revised proposals did still include the access control, uh, control measures, but the, the LAF have responded to the revised proposals basically saying that that we still have concerns with with the proposals so we've we've essentially reinforced the the comments that we made with the 
with the previous version as well, but uh, it hasn't actually been determined. But but they are st uh, the access control measures are still part of the proposals from from the applicant. That, that's really helpful, Steve. Yeah. Thank you. And, and there was a second kind of follow up point, which was to widen that accessibility angle. So, um, a, a couple of people have approached me about. So, so while I say on the on the Cottingham to Hull cycle route, they're removing a lot of these barriers, and that's really welcome. There are specific wards in the Hull area. Uh, where ward committees and area committees are wanting to put barriers back in or introduce new barriers. I think one of the examples was in the Sutton ward on the on the Hull to Honsey railway line, which seems like a bit of a, a, a retrograde step in some ways. And I also worry, and maybe this is something we can put to the Police and Crime Commissioner when he comes to, to a future meeting, that some of this is actually being encouraged by the police still. And as we've discussed many times, they're very effective at inhibiting uh, unauthorised users, uh, authorised users, but not that effective in in the unauthorised users. So it, it's a bit of a concern if, if these things are, are going to start popping up again when there seem to be good moves to, to get rid of them. Thank you, Alan. That was very good. I, I quite agree with you that um, if they're illegal users, they're going to go through whatever. And uh, and it's not it's not good to have too many access controls. But the one thing that has come out of this, I was really pleased on Patrick's behalf. The Trans Pennine Trail are uh, very much supporting the route through to Swine, the footpath through to Swine from the trail. Um, we had a discussion about this, and and um, they were they were delighted that people from Swine will be able to have a full circular then walking circular. Right. Any uh, any more questions on Alan's report? Right, so we move on to item eight, which is East Riding of Yorkshire Council report. It's uh, Patrick from the Countryside Access Team, uh, pages nine to ten on your paperwork. Uh, so, Patrick, if you would like to present your updated report. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, um, just go through the the items in front of you. So, England England Coast Path. So, as you're aware, we submitted our three, three objections through to Natural England for the stretch um, from the Humber Bridge through to, through to Easington. So it was Salt End, Hazel Foreshore, um, and at Easington itself. So we've expressed concerns about the way that the, the, sort of the methodologies have worked for those three locations. And obviously, we're still awaiting to hear an outcome of the, uh, what the decision will be from Natural England or Planning Inspector, whoever actually assesses the, the, these comments. Um, so we've had, a, we've had a, a recent meeting with Natural England. Um, so I think from the East Riding's perspective, we're still on track to get our Bridlington to finally stretch back, well, not back open, open, ready for the 1st of April next, next year. Um, I understand that North Yorkshire County Council um, are having some difficulties with some of the construction sites, so it's unlikely that they'll be able to meet that um, meet that time frame um, and we're being encouraged to apply for a, a, a construction grant to um, install the, the, the structures that we need from Bridlington to, to Easington so we'll be applying for that you know next realistically probably next April May April May time subject to Natural England you know confirming that the fund is there and that, that we can bid it and we can bid into it. Uh, secondly, rights away improvement plan. So Mark, Mark Jessup has is although he, re, he retired, we've brought Mark back as a strategy. I've asked Mark to come back to help us with the rights away improvement plan, which is which is great, which is great news. Um, so Mark's been really busy, um, sort of rewriting it and and giving it a refresh, and that's that's out for consultation now as we as we speak. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it's out and anyway. I've been away for a few days, so it was meant to be going out. So um, if it's not gone out, it's going it's, uh, be going out this 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 week. Um, so it's a good good opportunity for everyone to chip in their feedback. I know they'll have been involved so far, but this is really about asking the public, you know, the current user groups, parish councils, um, you know, people that like exploring the countryside, hopefully people that don't as well, you know, and we get a, a really good range of opinions and views on on how we should be managing our rights away network for the next for the next 10 years. Um, so that's all that's all gone really well. I think Mark's done a really good job job with that and you know he's got that finished in a in a very timely uh, timely fashion. So we might not have Mark with us after December to analyze all the feedback and comments. So 
that that task might rest with Debbie and myself. So that'll keep us that'll keep us out of mischief anyway. How tricky it went. It actually went live on Monday, so it's out on our website. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. That's great. Yeah, so it's out live now for those of you that want to take a look and um, you know go through the feedback and the questions and what have you. So on the Republic Rights of Wayside, we're slowly now sort of wading through all of the defects that we had during that during that sort of horrendous time when when we were being contacted by by far too many customers and we just couldn't keep pace with all the inquiries we were having. So we're sort of seeing that seeing the back of that now, which is which is good. Um, but obviously, you'll all be aware of this. Prices for timber and steel just seem to be rocketing at the moment. And we're also struggling to find um, contractors that can work at a reasonable reasonable rate as well. Everyone seems to be absolutely, um, you know, chock-a-block with work. So things have slowed down a bit. And obviously, we're hoping that the prices drop next year. Um, otherwise, it's, it's going to be a worry for us moving, moving forward. So our bridges team have been they're still cracking on, doing all the surveys of the bridges that are over five metres and they're procuring a package at the moment of several structures, which isn't the way they normally work. They normally do one bridge at a time, but they've decided to try and achieve some economies of scale by actually um, putting quite a few bridges into a, into a package. And one of them is this bridge, which we've been, has been missing for about four four or five years, I think now. So quite pleased that we're going to be able to get that one into this into this next procurement exercise. Is that Frodingham? Uh, no, it's Woodmansey. Oh, whereabouts in Woodmansey is it? Um, is it, I think it might be Park Farm Yeah, area. it's around Park Farm. Don't know the number, no. sorry. Yeah. So in, in among the other bridges, have we got um, Salt Marsh, Oldborough and North Frodingham in there? I'd, I, I'd, I'd have to go back to our bridges team to, to confirm which ones are in that, in that list. I can, do, I can do that, and then we can circulate a note of, of which ones are in. And some, some of the smaller bridges that need replacing, uh, specifically in Holderness, are, are your team on with those? Yes. Good, because there there's two that have caused problems in Oldborough, between Oldborough and Fickling on yeah. that. Yeah, for the Pretty smaller well. ones, then we'll have those in. We'll have those in hand. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Anybody yeah. got any more questions about bridges? It seems to be a regular topic. Ian's laughing. <laughs> well, we'll wait to see what's on the bridges list. Carry on, Patrick. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So, just really tipping you off about Year of the Coast, two thousand and twenty-three. Obviously, it was it was meant to be two thousand and. I think it was 2020 originally, and then it moved to 2021, but it's now, it's confirmed, it's 2023 officially, the year of the coast, so, you know, an opportunity, hopefully we've got our England coast path open by, open by then, and, um, you know, an opportunity for everyone in the East Riding to, to, you know, engage with that, businesses as well, and, you know, people that like to explore the countryside, so no doubt there'll be quite a bit of excitement about that, you know, moving, moving forward, and most of that work is, it's been coordinated by our tourism team. So visit visit Hull and East Yorkshire trying to pull together sort of packages and ideas and, and uh, itineraries. Um, National Trails Alliance. Um, we've spoken about this quite a few times at previous meetings. So the National Trails National Trails Alliance, uh, a group of all the national trails grouped together and the, and the part of this, what we call the Alliance, it's an informal semi semi-formal gathering of people, but they've now applied for charity status to establish a charity to sort of really take forward the work of National Trails. And uh, the application went in, um, I think it was about six weeks ago, something like that. And it's been, it's been turned around in exceptional quick time and they've, they, we are now a charity, say we, um, you know, I'm one of the trustees at the moment for a temporary period, trying to push this thing forward. Um, but in the new year, we'll be advertising formally for sort of permanent permanent trustees. Um, so the, maybe of about 10, 10 people from across the country um, who are passionate about national trails and want to see them, you know, enhanced and protected and all the rest of it. So it's really good. It's quite an exciting time, I think, for national trails. And obviously all the all of the England Coast Path will be encompassed into the into the charity as well. So this is charities there to really push forward and work with DEFRA and other government departments and obviously with Natural England to really, you know, 
champion national trails and all the benefits that they that they provide for communities and people that like to people that like to use them. Obviously, they've been one of the great success stories, really. I think of uh, of the access side of things from natural England perspective, following on from Countryside Commission who designated most of them in the past. So it's a bit of a success story. So we're hoping that that's going to the um, the charity is going to be a real real success. And then um, lastly, just to say that we. We've done some planning training. So Debbie and myself um, spends for about an hour or so um, going through our planning policy guidance document that we wrote with the support of the local access forum, you know, over a year ago now, and getting into sort of detail of planning applications and what, what we're sort of looking for and what our concerns might be, and looking at the the sort of strategic network of rights way and their importance for you know health and well-being and sustainable travel. I think it was. It was well received by the planning officers. A good, it was a good turnout. So hopefully they're they're a bit more um, understanding of public rights away. It can be quite a complex area, as you all as you all know. So and obviously planning officers have to take into account like quite a, a wide range of constraints and issues. So they can't really be experts in rights away, which is why they obviously need you know the defence map team and the sort of countryside team to sort of help them and support them when when assessing planning applications. So I think that was a big, big success for us and, uh, you know, put quite a bit of effort into it and I'm hoping it's going to, the rewards will uh, will come forward in the future. Okay. Michael, Any questions? Michael, can you hear me? Michael Butler's got his hand up. Right, Patrick. I can uh, hear Michael, yes. Just, just a query about, you said Salt Marsh Bridge. Is that the same thing as Laxton Bridge? Yes. Yeah. Is, the is, there any, is there any progress there? Well, Laxton, Laxton Bridge will will isn't on that isn't on the list that that the bridges team are looking are looking at because that's um so we're still negotiating with the landowner to try and secure a um you know a, a, a sensible alternative route around around that structure right. to create alternative lines to you know resolve a few anomalies in the area as part of an overall package. So we've not we've not got to the end of that process yet. So we've not really got a scheme that we're that we're happy with that, that would satisfy everyone's everyone's needs yeah you can't please all the people all the time <laughs> <laughs> right terry's got his hand up terry yeah Hello? got you yeah yeah it was just uh, to pat it really we've i brought this up before and we've talked about this signing that's a bit um, misleading signing on the ground um i know in the past, there has been signage put up uh, from previous um, people, uh, in our teams, um, but it appears to be happening again. Uh, new signs appearing when um, there actually aren't any new um, uh, new routes appearing on the definitive map. I just wondered whether it's a case of the on the ground team being ahead of the game. Is that uh, is that an issue? Specifically up at Owlsthorpe, um, up Gilbert that way, um, there's some new Bradway signs up, and uh, there's no orders have gone through or been confirmed. I just wondered whether that is the case that um, that the the ground team are being ahead of the actual administration team. Is that the they case, Patrick? They're actually well, not really not. Not really. I mean, a lot of these routes, um, there's an acceptance that public public rights exist from 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 the landowners, and, yeah. and that's probably been there for a long long period of time. You know, stepping back to when it was Humberside County Council. Um, yeah. So we may have we may have signed routes from the, from the sort of 1980s onwards, with the belief yeah. and fair knowledge that w that the Howard Authority felt these were public rights of way, and and that a, that a sign. Then helps and shows people that it that it that it's you know on balance of probabilities very likely to be a public right. So I particularly as the landowners were sort of accepting that. Um, so we would probably have signed them as public as public bridleways if there were if if there were lanes. Now clearly, if evidence comes along and um, to suggest that the bridleway should be a restricted byway or byway open to all traffic, which obviously couldn't happen now because of the NERC Act. Then you know once that was then confirmed on the definitive map with the different states, we would sign we would sign them with the correct with the correct status. So I think the bridleway signs are probably a reasonable compromise 
for the majority of users based on the basis that the landowners are supportive of public of public rights mm. until we get to the point where we actually finally determine what the status is, which, as you know, mm. could take us another 20, 30, 40, 40 yeah. years or, or more because we've got absolutely hundreds of these to, to look at. Yeah, yeah. So you're sort of admitting that there is a likelihood of a right of way, uh, but you're signing them as broad ways or as such. We wouldn't sign any. We wouldn't sign. Uh, we wouldn't sign anything that we weren't very confident did have public public rights on it. And obviously, if any of the landowners said, "Well, we're not. We don't accept that," then we wouldn't sign it. Obviously, but it's where the landowners are saying, "Yeah, we we accept that route has public has public rights." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's no, you know, I think we, we that seems to me to be fair and and, and and proportionate. Is that the landowners are happy, the local community get a route to use. Um, mm -hmm. The only people that will, might be disadvantaged will be carriage drivers or um, or those that want to, you know, drive drive drive, drive motor vehicles. Yeah, but if they, if they don't if they don't appear on the definitive map at all, they don't then... appear on the definitive map. No. If they, if they don't, no, but the sign is not Yeah, well, obviously, if those, if yeah, if people want them to to be recorded as a as a, a as a byway or restricted byway, then obviously people can put Schedule fourteen applications in, and you know, obviously we're expecting that yeah. that to happen because of the of the of the cut off date, because they are unrecorded public rights. It's just that we have them, we have some of them signed. Yeah. <coughs> so shouldn't they really be on the walking the riding website? Or is that, is that later? Can't is include that later them. Yeah, we can't we can't show them on walking the riding website because we take the data set from from the definitive map. So the walking the riding layer is taking all all the recorded public rights of way that exist mm -hmm. on the on the on the definitive map, like the working copy definitive map, and then that shows them in electronic format. Yeah, I think so you it's can probably. Say yeah. yeah, for the benefit of everyone else, probably something that we can move this onto the sub on the rights away subgroup, really. Otherwise, yeah. we're, we yeah, could end I up so. talking about yeah, <laughs> green lanes good. and signing for quite quite some time. Yeah. Yeah, I, agree, I agree, Patrick. Yeah, yeah sure. get that forward yeah. to the subgroup in February. Then, yeah, sure. Yeah, Any okay. questions for Patrick, Michael, and Terry? Still got their hands up. Sorry, not me. John Gatenby's has got his hand up now. <laughs> more a comment than a question um if things are being accepted as a right of way and people new to the area are using them the signage is useful because it keeps people from a landowner and manager's point of view it keeps people in the right direction on the right side of the hedge in the right place and doing the right things if they just leave the road and not sure at all where they're going that's when we have the public um free range, and that isn't always compatible with our agricultural activities. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. So thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I won't hold my breath on uh, getting the right answer from the inspector around King George Dock, but it'd be a shame if they send everybody up a very busy main road rather than agree to get a 150 yards of what is perfectly good right of way onto the map. It's... Um, it'll be a complete travesty and we'll end up doing like we do in, um, where was it, somewhere up north I went to. We end up walking through the, on a main road when we could have gone around the edge. So thank you very much for that. Um, we move on to page 11, which is uh, the definitive map. Um, so it's over to you, Debbie, for that. Let me find page 11. No, well, I'm on different pages to you. You're all right. It is page 11, Hazel. Well, it is on mine anyway. Oh, yeah, page 11, <laughs> yeah. yes. I'm there, I'm there, yeah. Yeah, so we've actually, we have been doing work, obviously, but we've not actually had any um, complete confirmed orders in this in this quarter. Um, they will actually come in the next, well, the quarter from um, the last quarter, but we have got some confirmations that have been done, like Hollim and Bridlington, and I think there's one at Howden. So um, they're just coming through, and they'll show in the next lot of figures. Um, the next quarters, the next quarters figures are going to look a lot better than this quarter's figures. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. 
Yeah, well, you know, we all know what it's like. It takes time. And until we get that six week confirmation, we can't, they don't become legal or, or effective. So we, that'll happen, like I say, next time. Um, we did get a motion put through from um, Councillor Hammond. Hammond, yeah. Um, obviously, but he's, he's he was quoting to for re resources to go out and search to put these on the map. And as we all know, that's not what the definitive map team does. We need the resources to research the ones that are on the map. Um, so I have put this forward to um, the people higher up and I'm waiting for a response on that. But yeah, um, Councillor Hammond was wanting the cut-off date, um, cancelling as with what um, the JLAF was wanting or to extend the JLAF wanted that early on in the year, but we've got nothing. We've ne heard nothing back from that at all. Um, so, yeah, I'm just waiting to see what ha what is happening with this motion from Councillor Hammond. Um, and it basically needs the parishes to and members of the public to put um, those Schedule 14s onto our um, register. And it's the resources are required for us, for us to actually research them, not go out and find them. Can, can I just ask Debbie about the one at Howden? Is it with the new building uh, workers? Yeah, the new there? housing, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. have there been diversions to the uh, the existing uh, right of way? But there there have been, yeah, there have been temporary diversions, yeah. Yeah, the signs seem, the signs seem to have disappeared, that's all. Yeah. It, yeah, I, they're... It goes down the edge of the the site to the west of the site, and then sort of across the back around the ponds at the at the um, north of the site. But yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. But the Ian, Ian's got his hand up. Sorry, Mike. Ian's got his hand up as well. To ask yes, his I'd I'd like to in the context of um, the, um, uh, the the um, extension of the date or the cancelling of the date for registering historic footpaths. While we've got Andy with us, and I hope he's still with us, uh, Andy McIntosh, uh, what, does New England, does uh, Natural England, in fact, have a view on this? And are they pressing government, in fact, equally, in fact, to actually do something about this date? Andy, just for context, we've made a case to the minister, um, if only because, of course, time is short, and we don't really want this date to actually stop the process and we lose some of these historic paths. You're going to get sick of me saying this. Um, I can't say much at the moment. Um, but I do know that uh, one of my um, colleagues in DEFRA um, is at the moment uh, preparing a brief for the Secretary of State about the various options for the cutoff date. Um, so we expect to hear something relatively soon about watch whether this space. Yeah, it's, it's definitely watch this space, but we we're thinking we'll hear something on it sooner rather than later. Sorry, Mike Butler, I think I cut you off. Did you want to ask another question of Debbie? Uh, no, not really. Oh, it's just that the temporary diversion signs uh, seem to have disappeared on the on the building site. Can we could look. Me? We could look at yes, Michael. I can. Yeah, we can look into that for you and see because um, it'll be the countryside access officer that um, deals with those temporary ones. So we can look into that for you. Right. Thank you. And can I ask you one, Debbie? While we're on defensive yeah. map, York yeah. Road, Willoughby. Um, they went and looked at it and said it had been, you know, been left alone. They'd left a gap. Well, they're building there again, and it looks like they're actually fenced the whole thing off. Right. Okay. okay. I will, I will check with Mark, but he is pretty much at the end of his research on that one, so there should be some consultation coming out pretty soon on it. Yeah, well, it was Bonus Electrical, but they left, and the yeah. new people who've gone into there have put a fence right across, and okay. I can't see that there's any way through. Okay. Uh, I mean, it may be covered in vegetation, I can't see it, but it looks a bit odd to me. Yeah, okay. okay. No worries. Yeah, thanks, Hazel. Right. 
Uh, Mike, you've still got your hand up. No, I haven't. Right. I don't, I don't know how to cancel it. Okay, <laughs> then, right. So uh, thank you very much for that, Debbie and Patrick. Um, we've got no secretariat update on the, end, end, uh, on the agenda this time. Um, we'd like to thank Steve for all the hard work he's put in over the last few months and getting us all this paperwork for our Zoom meeting. So have you anything to say, Steve? <laughs> Well, thank you for that uh, that comment, Chair. Uh, well, I don't have anything formal to say. I'd obviously just like to take the opportunity to thank uh, thank all of the forum members, sort of on behalf of the council, on behalf of the appointing authority, for, for their help during the year. I think it's fair to say it's probably been another strange year, as we've uh, we've not met in person again. We've been uh, uh, sort of entirely on Zoom for the for, for the main meetings. So uh, so thanks to to all the forum members for their, for their input. Uh, for the for, for the new forum members who who joined us this year, th thank you to you too. We, we we will meet in person at some point, I hope, uh, rather than continuing just seeing each other on screen. So, so yeah, for me, it's just a it's just a thanks to everyone and thanks to thanks to all the officers for for, for contributing to the forum. And we'll 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 crack on into the new year and see see how things go. Obviously, in a changing in a changing climate. But thanks again. Steve. Right, so we move on to um, item nine, consultation update. Can I ask you all for a thumbs up to note the updates on pages 12 and 13, which was the rights of way improvement plan review, Castle Hill Aqua Green and the Drain Flood Alleviation Scheme, uh, Hornsey for supporting document, which we have. Um, wait, I've got to ask you something about it in a minute. Um, but what we've actually got in paper, can you all just agree that for starters? Everybody all right? Yeah. Okay. Ian, I'm coming, I'm coming to you with, with Hansi for in a minute. Yes, I want to just actually say that the Jocks Lodge, uh, the Lazat um, uh, crossing point of the dual carriageway, I, I personally think that we should give our thanks to the people, in fact, have actually looked into this. In fact, we've raised this on several occasions and they have taken away our concerns. And it strikes me that given the problems with the topography at that particular location, they have at least, in fact, come up with a reasonable compromise solution, which probably will work. I half suspect, if that be, that um, Alison will probably think that the sight lines are still a little restricted from the point of view of the... Uh, wheelchair, uh, getting across the road in a wheelchair. But having said that, at least, in fact, they've actually made a move. And the only alternative, to my mind, in fact, probably would be a bridge. That's roof, roof actually. Oh, sorry. It was it roof, right. Um, it would be a bridge. Um, so to all intents and purposes, I think, in fact, we've actually got, um, we've got, we've got a reasonable answer here. Thank you. Can I, can I um, disagree with you on that one? It was very nice that they moved it. But if you actually go and stand on the side of the road and look at the traffic flow as it is at 60 miles an hour, single carriageway, it will be quite difficult to get to a central reservation. And if we're going to have two carriageways in either direction, even at 50 miles an hour, if you've got somebody in a wheelchair or somebody with a pushchair and a dog or somebody who is not particularly ambulant, and there's a lorry doing 50 miles an hour and it slows down. And there's a lorry on the outside overtaking it who doesn't see the person on the side of the road. It's an accident waiting to happen. And I do think that everybody needs to go and look at the crossing because I really believe it needs to be um, a signalled crossing. I mean, it's not going to slow the traffic down or not because there are not a huge number of people. It's not as if you're in the middle of Hull going across a zebra crossing all the time but it will make it much, much safer. I mean, if we can save one person from getting killed at that point, and there has already been a person killed, um, while it's been single carriageway, we need to get this as a signalled crossing. It's very good that it's moved, that helps, but it isn't the ultimate solution. If you stand on the side of that road and visualise two lorries coming towards you, one's on the near side, one's on the outside, and the ones on the outside is at the back end of the other lorry. It will not see who's on the inside of that road. So anyway, Linda's got her hand up. 
I couldn't agree more, Hazel. It's an absolute accident waiting to happen. I live along the side of that road and I cross it. And it, and you say there's not many people cross it, but it's surprising how many people do. There must be, I would think, in excess of 50 people a day crossing that road. And if you think of families, if you've got um, a parent with two children on, on bicycles or trying to get across the road, like you say, um, push chair with a dog, it is an absolute accident waiting to happen. It's just so, so dangerous. And I don't think moving it has made any difference. And um, I think the other thing is as well, I mean, there's quite a lot of horses that use that crossing. And my horse is pretty good in traffic. But if I had to wait on that central reservation where potentially there could be four wagons you know, going along the same time, it's going to spook them terribly. I mean, it's just not safe for, for horses. It's not safe for cycle. It's not safe for people who are, like you say, as nimble. You can't. I've been nearly run over on that road before. I've got part way across and had to run back as a single carriageway. It is just an absolute accident waiting to happen. What it needs is a bridge. And I think if you haven't got a bridge, you need traffic lights because you cannot do it. If you've got two lanes of traffic going 60 miles an hour one way, it's just dangerous. It really, really is. Um, like I say, I see it all the time and I've seen near misses. People don't stop. They don't, don't, they don't seem to see people on the side of the road, like pedestrians, cyclists. How they don't see horses, I don't know, because I always wear high vis, but they just don't seem to acknowledge that you're there. I can't understand why they don't put um, some sort of a bridge over the roundabout end and, and move all the, instead of moving it, taking them down the old Beverly Road to take the traffic, take it across the main road at the roundabout and then take it down Woodhill Way and use that as the access. That would be far more sensible. And then school children can use it to go to Cottingham and um, pedestrian, cyclist, horse riders can use it to go towards Beverly. It would be much more sensible. Well, I, I do know from the financial costings that a bridge is never going to happen, but I do think that a signal controlled crossing, a Pegasus crossing would be the answer. But I, all I will say as the chair um, is I ask everybody to go to Lazatz, you can park there, it's quite easy, stand on the side of that road and consider walking across the road in one lane of traffic, let alone getting across in two lanes of traffic in either direction, even with a reservation in the middle. It's going to be an absolute nightmare. Like it's Brian it's Sav dangerous. Brian Savage, Brian Savage, you've got your hand up. Well, I just want to echo that. Uh, I think, I mean, there's a continuous stream of traffic along that road as it, as it is now. It's extremely difficult to, to, to get across. Just adding a central reservation is not really going to help the situation. Uh, to be honest with you, it does need traffic signals there. It really does. Terry, you've got your hand up. Yes, it's all been said, really. I agree totally. At least signals. I mean, underpass or a bridge would be nice. Maybe not aesthetically, but up at the surface point or move the, move the location. You know, at least a light. If it's got to be there, it's got to be lit. Uh, signalled, I think. When I saw Mark's little, little diagram, I thought, when I saw it laid out there, I thought, it frightened me to death to, to think about all those people trying to, you saw it all in one go, didn't you? Cars, lorries, wheelchairs, horses, and, okay, you know, yeah. it will happen. And, yeah. and the other thing is there's a projected increase in the amount of traffic um, over the next 10 years. So, um, because that, oh, that's, yeah, that's, that, that's why they're improving the roads, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's come out in the uh, it, they're improving it down near Papa's Fish and Chip Shop, so that's where those figures came from. Um, so I think when you're all in, the, when you've all had a look and you're all in agreement, can you all let Steve know what your preference is? And I will say, bridges and underpasses will not get the money for it, it's signal controlled, or that's it. <laughs> So, um, right, have I, Terry's still got his hand up, Alan's still got his hand up. I was just going to echo the points I'd made that I think it's very, very difficult to cross there. It will be harder with more traffic. And it's even worse than what's been said because I've had people deliberately speed up and sound the horn 
at me because I've not crossed the road quickly I enough in their view. Yeah. Um, and I think we've, we've got to recognise that's the way a lot of people behave. And uh, it, I, I'm not convinced about the bridge argument, not having enough money. This this is, they're spending a lot of money on this scheme. It, it, Percentage-wise, it's not a huge increase in cost, but if they say there isn't the money, there isn't. But certainly the traffic lights, I think, on balance of risk uh, is, is far preferable to, to a sort of dash and pray approach, which is what you're going to have going forward and you've got now. I think I think Steve's got our the gist of this, haven't you, Steve? You can. Uh... Uh, in, indeed, I mean I, I've I've noted all the comments raised. I, I'll probably just send uh, send an email round to to all of the members uh, following the meeting, just to obviously invite any further comment as well, and I'll I'll, I'll feed back to the uh, to the uh, to the project team. Yeah, because I mean to put a to put a Pegasus crossing in is about sixty thousand pound. Put a bridge in is about half a million. I think I know which way we're going. Um, we have the, the details for the next consultation stage for the draft ROIP will be circulated to joint last members after today's meeting. Um, you're asked to please share details with all your relevant contacts. Um, and the content consultation um, is now open until the 31st of March 2022 not the end of February 2022. So uh, you'll be getting that shortly. Um, we've dealt with us that. Uh, Ian and Andrew, can you summarise the Hornsey 4 project proposals and outline the key points from the JLAS perspective? Okay, and if you have a presentation. Andrew's, yes, Andrew's here, Ian's here. Away you go, boys. Well, Steve, I'm having some difficulty here with sharing the screen, I think. Oh, we might have got it. Uh, is that successful? Is the screen shared there? Yep, yeah, we've got the yeah, Cairns Corridor yeah. picture. Okay, uh, this is the Orsted Haunty 4 onshore uh, cable corridor. Um, brief introduction. You've got the papers, so in fact, you should more or less, in fact, see what this is all about. Um, what we've effectively got is uh, a roughly uh, 50 kilometers or so, in fact, of cable corridor. This is a subsurface, it's going to be buried with a landfall around about Balmston up here on, on the coast, just south of Bridlington. It wends its way down through the riding, effectively skirting to the west side of Beverly, uh, especially the hallowed ground of Beverly Westwood. And in fact, it ends up at Craigiebeck, which in fact is where the substation is. Um, this has been a project running for now something in the region of three to four years with a phenomenal amount of consultation, certainly in fact on the ground of uh, those that have a particular vested interest, uh, but also of course about the wider community. Um, what we have in fact is something around 36 of the uh, off-road crossings which are affected by this particular cable corridor. And I've actually extracted the, uh, a list of them. In fact, we can see on this particular screen here. So 23 defined footpaths, on the, in other words, on the definitive map. We've got one proposed footpath, which of course is now uh, actually agreed. In fact, that's the um, England coast path. Uh, eight defined bridleways, um, uh, three cycleways, which um, are, are not in fact, of course, about necessarily uh, rights of way per se, but in fact are uh, divine. And then one other signed way, which in fact is the Beverly 20. How are they going to cross these? Well, we've been, uh, this is Andrew and I have in fact been guarding the rights of way of, in fact, of, of certainly in fact the, the local population, hopefully, in fact, by drawing attention to um, the difficulties that we're going to actually face in the future. But um, listing these, in fact, again, seven of them involve trenchless horizontal direct drilling. Um, but of these, this means effectively that there won't be any disturbance of the pathway itself. But of course, five of these, in fact, actually require a temporary closure. 18 of the public rights away, in fact, are going to actually involve open cut trenching. 
And we have been particularly concerned that, in fact, there seems to be some thought that these are not overly important in terms of rights of way. I'm, 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 I'm giving you impressions more than anything else. But we, Andrew and I, in fact, have certainly been pressing the fact that, in fact, for those people that use these, these, in fact, are vital as part of their recreation or their healthy getting out into the countryside, et cetera, et cetera. And for some of them, in fact, they're actually daily exercise routes. So 18 involving open cut trenching. And these, in fact, are the ones which, in fact, I think are particularly at risk in terms of the long term. They're going to, in fact, actually require closure and or diversion. Come to this in a minute. There's one which involves a long term diversion and restoration. Um, and that is, in fact, actually the Barmston 4, uh, Barmston Football 4. Um, there's one which, in, uh, two rather, which involve temporary closure. This is in Rowley, Rowley um, to, the, um, uh, the, to the west of Beverly. Um, and one including, uh, one which involves permanent closure and diversion, which is in fact Skidby Football 16. Um, there are other crossings which are not so much in fact part of our purview, but in fact they will actually, interesting enough, involve horizontal direct drilling. So quite a significant, in fact, actually disruption to the, to the actual public rights of way and other routes, if that be off-road routes, if that be in the county, 36 altogether. <clears throat> Andrew and I have only jointly registered um, so that we can actually make what are known as relevant representations to the planning inspectorate. Um, we're already, in fact, logged in on that, in fact, but uh, we have some uh, we, we need some uh, you to, in fact, to agree in principle some of the points that we want to raise. And those points are, in the first instance, in fact, a need for greater clarity and um, specifics uh, about the PROW diversions. In fact, currently described, if that be in the documentation which has been submitted to the planning inspectorate as if feasible. In other words, in fact, seemingly, in fact, no specifics, in fact, have actually been dis decided, in fact, at this particular moment. Um, Skidby Footpath 16, interesting enough, in fact, has actually at some of the consultation meetings actually been shown uh, to have some sort of specificity about it. But in fact, at the moment, in fact, on the actual um, application, in fact, there, there is, in fact, only a diversion area, as it's called, in fact, which actually occupies something like six hectares. Um, which, of course, in fact, is not very specific as far as, in fact, the future is concerned. In other words, in fact, um, it could well be, in fact, that this could end up anywhere in the, within those six hectares. Uh, this is to the west of the uh, Craigiebeck um, uh, uh, substation area, for those of you, in fact, not familiar with north of Cottingham. Um, there are, in fact, actually no details whatsoever, in fact, for all but two other of the public rights of ways. And both Andrew and I are very concerned that to all sense purposes, in fact, the if feasible uh, caveat, which is in fact attached to any one of these, in fact, could mean effectively that there is no diversion put in. Uh, and this will actually involve something like 18 of the actual footpaths, which are actually uh, crossed. Um, the second of our requirements, as we see it, in fact, is that the closures for each of the PROWs is, in fact, we think too long. The application, in fact, which gives a lot of attention to public rights of way, probably partly as a function of the fact that we've been actually making sure that it's been part of their thinking. Um, in fact, it actually states throughout the document about there's up to three months on each occasion and, and less than six months over the project duration. Well, the project duration is only 36 months, in fact, according to them. Um, and it strikes us that for any one of these footpaths to actually be closed for something like one sixth of that total time, given the fact that they're not actually going to be working on the whole of the cable route at any one time, uh, strikes us as too long, in fact. <coughs> Although we don't want to be too specific at the moment, but in fact, the closures ought to actually involve much less than three months at a, on each occasion and six months overall. The, oh, I'm, I'm uh, 
unfortunately, I don't know why, I can't get to the next slide. Not sure what it is, or is that it? Oh, here we are. Right, okay, the third of the, of the issues that we wish to raise, and we've raised this in fact in the pre-application uh, stages, um, but, um, uh, but have been rub uh, shrugged off in fact, is that the long-term responsibility for restoration, uh, for example, if that is a function of surface settlement, in fact, ought to be taken by the company or the, or the company that owns the cable routeway, in fact, um, once this thing has been installed. Um, as I say, in fact, we've had this thing, in fact, dismissed, in fact, as not having been part of the previous installations that the company has, in fact, actually been involved with. Uh, but we think, in fact, that they, this kind of soils which are, we're dealing with, especially in Holden S, in fact, which are easily poached, very heavy clays, um, could in fact actually suffer from considerable settlement. I've done a rough calculation based on the kind of bulk densities which you can expect from dilated and, and consolidated soils. And the suggestion from me would be in fact that the actual settlement could be as much as 10 to 25 in, um, centimeters, sorry, 10 to 25 centimeters. Um, that to all intent and purpose, in other words, up to 10 inches. Um, mm -hmm. What this effectively means is, in fact, you could, and over the cable, uh, the routeway width of 80 metres, actually have literally uh, boggy ground, because, of course, in fact, this will actually merely become a quagmire. So our suggestion is, in fact, that this is actually considered by the planning inspectorate as a requirement, as they are doing, in fact, for other major projects. If that be All it means for the company is it takes out an insurance policy, if nothing else. Uh, so that in fact can actually swing into action should there in fact actually be some subsequent problems with the actual lines as far as the PROW are concerned. And the fourth of the uh, issues which we want the planning inspectorate to consider is that the national planning policy, which is of course under revision at the present time, Steve's given me the fact that it's paragraph 100 in the revision, uh, indicates that anything affecting a PROW should in a perfect world in fact mean that the PROW is in fact enhanced if possible. And uh, what we as an LAF in fact might usefully do is in fact actually press for committed funds, which in fact actually might well be used for improvements in the parishes that are affected by the corridor as it goes across them. So what we want to put to you as an LAF is in fact the fact that you endorse um, the four issues which in fact I've just gone through. So Andrew and I in fact would like to be able to in fact actually press the planning inspectorate at this juncture to consider the greater quality and specificity of the diversions of any of the PROW the temporary closure of each PROW being too long, as they put it in the actual document. The long-term responsibility for restoration, very important, we think, if, that be, if only because we don't want to lose what could be up to 19 PROW, uh, just because, in fact, we've had a cable come through. And the fourth one is, in fact, that there should be some sort of cash made available, in fact, for enhancement of PROWs, especially in those parishes well, particularly in those parishes which have actually been affected. So that's it, Hazel. Thank you very much, Ian. That was very good, uh, very, well, very understandable. Um, the only thing on, on that screen is temporary closure, yes, is too long, but can we put that we do get a diversion for them where we have temporary closures? A suitable diversion, not, in a, not a long one. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is on Skidby 16, if they're going to have a closure and diversion um, as an enhancement, we get an upgrade at the same time. If they're talking, looking over somewhere in a yeah. six hectare site, yeah. that, that that could be one of the um, enhancements. Yeah. So can we go back to off, off that screen, please, Ian? And we'll, uh, we'll have everybody back on screen and then we can uh, have a discussion. Thank you. Right. Um, I'm going to take a vote straight away because that was very clear, very concise, yeah. and I think it covers everything that we want. Um, I've got three hands up. 
I'll ask you first before I take a vote. Right, um, Alan Gribben first. Hello, Alan. Sorry, my, my hand up was from last time. I apologise. Sorry. Right, John Gatenby. Uh, yeah, uh, particularly on the enhancement side, um, most of these large projects have a PR department and we should be able to talk nicely with them to help Patrick with signage. And as we're also looking at um, health benefits, the occasional seat where there's somewhere with a view and perhaps the potential for um, a little bit of resurfacing in some of the uh, more moist areas. But equally, I, I totally agree with what we we've had said to us by Ian. Surface um, stabilization on a heavy clay soil can be a 10 year prob problem before we, you've got it totally stabilized again in the long term from an industry point of view an agriculture point of view so far the contractors have been very receptive to what we've put to them and um, have gone away gone away having done most of the work in a manner better than we expected so thank you very much to them i could have cost can had his hand up there but he's not no. No, no you're off now right linda very then um uh, yeah, was, I agree. It's quite a, a very concise uh, presentation, uh, very understandable. But if they're to enhance footpath, would it not be, um, could we not go to them and ask for a contribution for a bridge over the 164 if, if that's going to impact? They've got obviously uh, going to be um, using the footpaths in the area and it would connect to that side. So maybe to go to them and ask for some money for a bridge as well. Silence was a deadly answer. Right, we'll think about that one. Um, so can I have a, um, a thumbs up on screen for those in favour of everything that Ian's put forward with the bit for the um, diversion as well as the, go on, what did I say? The, di the diversion where there's a temporary closure. I haven't got a thumb on mine. I don't know where mine is. Right. Have we anybody who's against that? Right. So, Ian and Andrew, you're on. You're, you're um, passed to go ahead with that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Uh, we go on to item 10, public right away subgroup update. Um <coughs> You've got a note of the subgroup discussions. Um, do any members have any questions as to whether soup you know, they would like to add to these um, the papers that you've already got? No hands up. All right, Alison. Yeah, just just a, a brief update. I've gleaned some information from the Bainton Parish Council minutes, um, and apparently there's some works. Um, proposed to their green lane, um, hopefully this financial year. Um, so, and there potentially could be a closure for 12 months um, next year. Um, so depend, it, apparently they had a meeting with highways who agreed that some urgent repairs were, were necessary. Um, and the, there's also been um, sort of um, comment from a local walking group two highways that it's it's really not fit for purpose so they are keeping an eye on how other green lanes are, um, are recovering in Garton and Sledmere um, so hopefully there might be an up, more of an update for the February subgroup. So we could probably find that Bainton gets add on to the seasonal TRO list but it's going to be like the one we've got at the moment it's not going to be just the winter it's going to be a long one until the land recovers. Initially I would think yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, everybody okay with that? Ian, you've got a question. Um, just, just a comment, of course, in fact, that at Bainton, that is part of the Minster Way, which in fact is, a, uh, I think is a national trail, is it in fact? No, no, it's, no just a publicised one. Oh, right, okay. All right, anything else on that? Ian, your hand's still up. Right. Um, so we move on to item 11, access and land management. Um, 
can you note the updates on the new animal welfare keeping of animals bill uh, update on the ELMS that we've got and the local trespass case linked to walking and cycling smartphone apps they seem to be rather on the increase it seems to be you find somebody's farm drive and you go up it and then you put it out and publicize it as it's a wonderful route um i think the nfu and the cla are trying to deal with this it's it's a huge problem it's not us it's nationwide um has anybody got any questions for um gordon and john on this Boys, nobody's asking you any questions. Thank you very much for your um, paper input. It's been very, very good. God's looking puzzled. Okay. I think we, we managed to say most of it, didn't we, when we spoke to Andrew earlier on. And, uh, Okay. The other thing is that the uh, the NFU has launched a rural road safety campaign this month, and the British Horse Society have got their Pass Wide and Slow campaign out there. I see Lincolnshire have refused signage that they've been offered by the British Horse Society. No cost to them. I hope if they offered it to East Riding, East Riding at least accepts it. It would be very nice. So um, there's nothing else on Ian. Uh, I just wonder, uh, under the Elms thing, I know we discussed it earlier on, but in fact, it's, uh, since it's on this uh, paper as well, um, I wonder whether Andy would be able to tell us if, in fact, any of the pilots actually are in the East Riding. The only um, sort of test and trial that's been done so far is uh, the one down in the Mendips. Um, but that's... Um, the ones that I sort of mentioned earlier that, that there could be a potential sort of access one uh, linked to the uh, local nature recovery, uh, they haven't been, uh, that, that's for uh, next year or the year after. So no decisions have been made about those yet and, and they will depend on what's, what comes out in the winter statement. Right, thanks for that. John Gainby, put your hand uh, up. To add, to add on to Andy's answer, um, the LEAF uh, ELMS trial did discuss um, permissive land management and that was concluded spring of this, this year and we didn't cut what the uh, top um, management of LEAF didn't come to a definitive answer on that but it's well within their uh, normal remit. LEAF stands for Linking Environment and Farming and is a national organisation and to follow on from the comment about um, the rural roads being dangerous. Unfortunately, in farming, our toys are restricted legally to 25 miles an hour, which does very much frustrate most drivers who are in a hurry to get from A to B by yesterday. And there aren't as many places at this time of year when the verges are a little bit damp and soft, where we pull off onto a verge. In the summer, we usually pull safely off into a verge this time of year. You have to make sure you're on hard, hard standing when you pull off the road, otherwise you end up with your trailer, with your load pointing sideways. So please, anybody who's driving in the countryside, give us a little bit more time, please. We aren't allowed to go faster, much as we would like to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right, Andy Mack. Uh, yeah, uh, just to go back to the um, the app um, question um, about sort of uh, walking riding apps. Um, it'd be interesting to know what sort of scale the uh, uh, problems are being encountered. We certainly had it fed back to us, um, whether it was last year or last year, I think, um, by um, the CLA and the NFU uh, that there had been incidents, but we're not, haven't really got an idea how many. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is because we're actually in, um, got some sort of dialogue with Strava at the moment nationally. Uh, we're talking about them, uh, about some of their what's called metro data, which is quite useful to see what people are doing. Um, but um, they have been fairly famously beforehand been difficult to actually get to talk to, but it looks like we have a, a way in at the moment. So it would be interesting to know of examples. So can I ask Gordon and John, if you, what you have on this, can you forward this through Steve to Andy, please? Thumbs up if you can. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much. Okay. Right. Um, we move on to news from our members. Um, 
You've got the list of the feedback from all the meetings that everybody's gone to. Um, I'll come to the Market Week and Canal Trail in a moment. Um, Alison, have you any update on green lanes in the Yorkshire Worlds or just what you've already said? Um, yeah, just what I've already said, really. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. OK, that's fine. Now, sadly, John Nicholson has um, decided to resign from his post on the East York Riding of Yorkshire Rural Partnership. Um, and so we're looking for a volunteer uh, to sit on this. It's um, so I don't meet too often. Um, and just take a few notes. I'm looking at Alison. She's looking in the other direction. <laughs> <laughs> Can I twist um, your um, I'm happy to give it a go. I was thinking maybe another year on the forum before I um, sort of... Um, we'll chuck you in the deep end. Everybody gets chucked in the deep end on this forum. <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's just that, you, you know, you, you've had a lot of input over green lanes. Um, you're in a very rural area. Um, there's all sorts going on around you. You've got tourism and leisure and just up the road at Sledmere. So um, would you like to volunteer? Um, your arm up your back? <laughs> do, do I have a choice? <laughs> no, no, not. Yes, of course you have a choice. Um, yeah, if I, yes, I will volunteer. But, um, oh, Steve, I'll, you've got to volunteer. <laughs> I can't guarantee you. Awesome. Um, okay. well, give, give it a year and see how you get on. All right, thank you. Right, so Steve's put you in. Thank you very much for that. Thank you for volunteering, Alice. That was really kind. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, Market Wheaton Canal Trail. You have a map of the route. Um, so has Gordon got anything to say to us about this? Thank you. Uh, I think Steve knows more than I do, but uh, the canal trail is now uh, Sorry, Gordon, you're breaking up. Uh, you're breaking up quite badly. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you I can hear now. me? I can now. Yeah. Uh, the Market Week Canal Trail. That's Steve. Get, get Steve. Okay, we, 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 got the, uh, we got funding from uh, uh, now putting the thing into place. So we, we've uh, engaged a um, Communique, which is a, a, a public relations company that does it, designs this kind of scheme, we, we, we've, we've got a logo, we're, we're uh, now planning where we're going to place our particular signposts and uh, features, gateway, uh, entry, um, uh, sign, big signposts these are. And we're also consulting again with the landowners and involved parties. Uh, so we are fully underway now. We've been spending the last two years trying to get this thing going. Now it's funded, we're all steam ahead. Excellent, I'm very Can pleased to hear that. Yes, yes. Yeah, Anybody got any questions? Yeah. Go on, carry on, Gordon, sorry. No, just to, the, we, we're working with Transpennine Trail, East Reading and Gorkshire Council as well. And uh, so we've got a very nice, happy team led by uh, Gordon Shields, who is the man who, who is chairman of Newport uh, Parish Council who was the man who did the original uh, River Funa and Market Week Canal feasibility, feasibility study, if you remember, was done in 2012. And that is the basis of this plan. Steve is with us as well. And Steve knows more than anybody about this project. So, Steve, you need to make comments too, if you, uh, if you feel you should. Uh, absolutely, Gordon. I mean, I mean, thanks for the for the update there, Gordon. Um, it, it, it's excellent to see the project making making progress because it, it is a community led scheme. Uh, I mean, G Gordon's been heavily involved working alongside Gordon Shields. The parish councils in the area are involved, and Market Wheaton Town Council are are, are a very proactive partner as well. So it's a good community uh, community scheme. Um, myself and Patrick are, are also attending the steering group meetings, offering uh, uh, the, any advice that we can we can offer. So um, the, the the project has secured over fifty thousand pounds worth of funding, and it's actually going to be delivering some access improvements, some heritage improvements, and engaging with the local communities. So it's made a it's made a very positive start. And there's actually another meeting tomorrow as as, as well. Um, we did receive. Uh, 
an update newsletter as well on the project, which didn't quite arrive in time to, to be included in the, in the meeting papers. But I'll circulate that onwards to, to all of the forum members as well, just to, to give a bit of extra, extra flavour. But it's, uh, it's, it's a good project and it's, it's, it's making progress. Can I ask you a question, Gordon? Are you on the east side of the canal as far as Sodhouse Lock, and then you go to the west side? Yes, you are right. Um, and uh, w w the, th that is one of the confusions, <laughs> one of the confusing points, because the canal effectively finishes at Sodhouse Lock, and then we actually walk on the uh, west side of the Back Delphin. Uh, so between the Back Delphin and the canal. And when we get to River Lane, we then cross over to the east side of the Back Delphin, which is becomes at that point Market Wheaton Beck, and that takes you into Market Wheaton at about about two and a half miles uh, into Market Wheaton, and happily the path goes. But unfortunately, we have to cross the 1079. That's the biggest problem we have, but we can cross that. We then walk into uh, the area near the post office. Uh, and where the new town council offices are in Market Wheaton. And it's a great place to, to, uh, to arrive because that connects with all the things that Market Wheaton has. And Market Wheaton Town Council, as Steve pointed out, they are the fund holders now. They will give this scheme continuity and long-term long continuity. Um, and, uh, and it arrives absolutely on their doorstep. So it's very good. Very much. Uh, how do you overcome Lawn Farm, or are they just letting you have it for walkers? Ah, well, we, Gordon, Shields, and myself, we've had discussions. This is one of the things that, that I, well, Gordon seems to think that I'm a specialist in, but because I'm a farmer, he thinks I, I get on with the farmers, but not necessarily so. But we've done very well with Mr. Sweeting. We've done very well. We also, amazingly, and I want to say, pay compliment to Mark Laverick, who has a reputation. His reputation precedes him. A very successful meeting with Mark. Uh, so we've ironed out one or two problem points. Uh, so we feel, and we're not ruffling any feathers at all. We also had a meeting with the uh, Ozen Hummer Dredge Board uh, because they own Sodhouse Lock and the area there. So uh, we, we've discussed with them their attitude towards signage and what they want to do with regards um, publicity for the use number drainage board and the good works that they're doing. Um, so we've got that ball rolling too, uh, and we will continue to have further discussions with landowners. The prep. Gordon. You're frozen, Gordon. Nope, you're still not there. Satellite's moved out of orbit. What do we do, Steve, on this one? I, I, I think, I think uh, Gordon does appear to have frozen. So I think we, we, I think Gordon covered the, the key points. So I think we probably just need to move on to the next agenda item, Chair. I would suggest. All right, thank you very much, Gordon. But we're going to have to cut you off there because you've frozen up and um, time's cracking on. But thank you for an excellent, uh, informative talk. Right, business between meetings. Um, can you notice on page 30, the Police and Crime Commissioner for Humberside has agreed to attend the JLAF meeting on the 16th of March. This could be quite exciting because last time they were coming, they sent a minion who was very negative. But I think the new Police yeah. and Crime Commissioner seems to be a lot more positive. So we look forward to that. Um, there was a very nice piece in the Driffield and World's Weekly newspaper um, about the Green Lanes. Uh, it's quite a good read, actually, if anybody can get hold of it. I usually get my copy forwarded to me by another member. Thank you, John. Um, so we've got another temporary closure at Wooddale, which happens quite quite regularly. Um, we've got two potential speakers who've been informally approached uh, for 2022, but you'll hear about them later. So have we any other business um, appertaining to the LAF? 
Any questions anybody wants to ask? Anybody have any pressing matters? What's oh, Terry? Hi. Yeah, just um, if there's any news on or updates about the two um, or metal highways that have been blocked, has Steve got any news on that? Chorthorpe and Longborough Lane, Alstwick. Any developments on that? I know you said that. Uh, I can tell you that been... Longborough Lane is number 49 on the list, according to the definitive map team. Um, and, oh, they yeah. want, and they wanted some more information. And I've managed to send them some more information this week. But I still need to know um, from you, Debbie, do you want me to go and put notices on site? Because it is unregistered land. So can you send me the laminated notices? And I'll put those out on site. And then we'll be a bit closer because, of course, it was one of Mike's applications. But it's unregistered land. So, And can you redact my name off it, please? Yeah, will do. Okay. And the other... The other one is I'm still waiting uh, laminated signs for Fox Cover Lane. Where's that one at Hazel? Boldington. Mm -hmm. Right. It'll there be one be. of the team that are doing them, so I'll check that with them. Well, Catriona did say three months ago I was supposed to be getting them right, before okay. the weather changed. All right, then. <laughs> I'll look into right, that. Carry on, Terry. Anything else? Yep. Chair, Chair, can I just answer Terry's question? Sorry as well. Uh, I, I, I've sent a reminder to chase up colleagues in highways, Terry. I'm afraid I've not got an answer, so I, I'll I'll chase it up. I'll chase it up again and hopefully get back to you. Oh, okay, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. I think I think the answer with that one, the one um, up Tibthorpe. No, yeah, near, it's on the way to Tibthorpe, isn't it? I think the answer is to take the gate out, put a new gate in, and. As long as the gate opens and closes, we'll all go quite quiet, won't we? We, we can yeah, use yeah. it. Yeah, aren't you? Right, yeah. Linda. Um, it's probably something that I need to speak to somebody else about, but um, I'm a mem I'm member of uh, Skibby Parish Council, and there is um, a footpath that, well, he, there isn't a footpath, but people tend to walk on the road where the new flood alleviation scheme have, has gone in on Eppleworth Road. Um, they come from Cottingham through to Skidby. Um, and we've applied and asked if we could have a footpath uh, to run along there. And the parish camp, or the East Riding have said no, because it's not wide enough to put a footpath in. But where they've put the flood alleviation, they did originally say we might be able to go around the back of it um, and, and, and take that in and, and be well off the road. But every time you drive down, there's always people walking along there, but they've just refused point blank to, to do anything about it and said it's going to cost too much and there isn't enough um, width of road. Is there anything we could do about that? Is there anybody we could talk to or appeal against it? Or did it ever come to in front of you guys when before I was a member? Or is there any information that you have? Well, we have had instances in the past where people have wanted a footway and there hasn't been enough room and there isn't the money and what they end up with is something called a trod is the room on the grass verge just to basically walk on the grass verge they say not they said it, it's not wide enough um but they fenced the flood alleviation down one side so if they moved the the fencing back it probably would be wide enough but i don't know whether that land belongs to Yorkshire water or if it belongs to highways um, it's just a really sort of difficult one because they say there is a footpath but that runs down from Castle Hill Road which is quite a long way around from Appleworth Road and it then doesn't link in to the roadway that runs up past the mill at Skidby and into Skidby itself uh, so none of it really sort of links up none of it really makes sense and we asked them, you know, if they would, because obviously there's a traveller site further down up on this road who they always on the use the road. And there's an awful lot of walkers that use that road as well. Like every time I drive down, there's somebody walking on that road. Um, it is quite dangerous, but it, it was just sort of really asking the question because I think it was between Cottingham Parish Council and Skidby Parish Council. And they were asking for sort of contributions, which we sort of like didn't dismiss out of hand. But it, they just 
East Riding have just said no way. I think if you send the map and, and exactly what you want to the subgroup, and, and we can probably look at it at the subgroup, I'm not saying we can do anything because it's in the interest of safety and everything. So we should be able to find somebody in the council who will look at it. That's Alan Gribben, you've got a question, hand up. Yeah, I'll just echo what, what's been said, but also to make it worse, the, the 60 MPH, the national speed limit's been reinstated since the works have finished. So there was, a, there was a temporary 30 mile per hour limit on there, which made it a little bit easier if you're going around that way. But it, it's now even more dangerous because vehicles accelerate up to, to 60 once they've left the, the Cottingham boundary. The, the other factor is that there's a an unofficial kind of de facto path that runs from Epperworth Road up to the top of Kelgate. It's the sign saying it's not a public right of way and don't take your dogs there. But what people have done, and, and no one has tended to object, but that is now uh, becoming more difficult because there's a drainage scheme for the new housing and so forth. So there's every chance you're going to get more people walking this route than you did before. So, so there is arguably a case for each riding revisiting that decision, but certainly in the interim, getting a traffic order to keep that speed limit down to 30 until you pass the, the A164 bridge. My other suggestion would be at this stage is for somebody to um, look at the enclosure award for Cottingham because the whole of that, the whole of Eppleworth Bottoms from Cottingham all the way to Raywell is on the Cottingham enclosure award. Um, and it will have a defined legal width and, and I think you might find that that defined legal, legal width is probably slightly wider than where it is currently fenced. I can't remember offhand if it's 40 foot or 60 foot between the ditches. But it's one or the other, which might help you. OK. Right, Linda and Alan, you've still got your hands up. Any questions? Let's, where do we find that information out? Uh, the Treasure House. Treasure House. You would have to ask them if you could look at the, there's, there are two awards for Cottingham um, and you'd probably have to get them to help you read the award. I would volunteer, but I just haven't got time at the moment to go up and read you. I mean, if you've never read an award before, they're a bit Martian, but um, it, it might it might be a help. Sorry to be a pest, but could you just email that information that I need yeah, to ask yeah. for? Would that be yeah. possible? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Right, Terry and Linda, got your hands up. Yeah, I was just, I was just saying, I think that's the Ellica coach already, isn't it, Hazel? Yeah, it's, it's the Cottingham and Ellica Kings Highway. Cottingham, yeah. So, uh, and I'm, I'm sure it's 40 or 60 foot wide. There'll be a pinch point in the middle of Eppleworth, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, right. Um, any other business? Lovely. Well, um, I wish you all a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I hope you all maintain your health through the coming year. And um, it all starts to settle down. I think we're just going to have to live with COVID one way or another. But I will see you all again on Wednesday, the 16th of March, hopefully in person. And can I thank Andy for coming? And uh, I hope you found it interesting staying with us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good. Right. So uh, I'll formally close the meeting at 1553.